A number of months ago, I uh, was approached by Serge, who was going to do the second half of this presentation. And he uh, had this, or had bought this thing. I'm not going to talk to you about what this thing is. That, but that's what Serge Besner is all about. Um, but he, uh, it had this clock component. And so uh, uh, he was wondering if I could maybe take a look at the clock component, uh, component and fix it. And so this is uh, the component that I received. And it's an interesting thing. It basically, it's uh, uh, what I'm trying to allude to is what am I? Where do I go? What do I do? Well, this is the whole unit that I received. And you can see at the top there that it has a platform escapement. This is an escapement that's given me much joy over the last couple of months. When you take the escapement off and that top plate off, you see that it has a four gear power train there. And that uh, very top little gear that you see there uh, feeds into the escapement wheel. Is also on the bottom part, it definitely has a spring. So just in case you're interested, Serge, I've completely cleaned and oiled everything. <laughs> so these components are doing just fine. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but if you go into the platform escapement component, uh, this is it. And oh, yes. Ooh, make sure that you, uh, Shirley, make sure you uh, mute your, I'll mute you, there, you're muted. Um, good, so you see the uh, escapement here, three views of the same escapement. Um, the left one on, on your screen is the more complete picture of the escapement. On the underside of the escapement, you can see there in the middle, middle slide, June 4th, 1948. So obviously that would have been about the manufacturing time. So this time piece was manufactured in around 1948. And if you look down towards the uh, balance wheel on the right hand side, it has some interesting uh, markings on it, English made <laughs> and ABEC. And so the question is what is that I tried to do some uh, some research on uh, ABEC, and the only thing that I could find is maybe there's a relationship of ABEC w turned into Smith Smith clocks. I know there were, is a Smith clock uh, manufacturing uh, company. There was one in England, so I think maybe the two are uh, related. But there's there's the there's the escapement in question, and. The question is, or not the question is, the observation is the escapement had uh, two broken pivots. The top one and the bottom one were broken. And what can we do about that? So uh, I offered to uh, do a pivot replacement on the balance staff. Now, of course, you start doing a lots of research on the internet about balance staffs and the various options that you can do. And here's an example of the, uh, the arbor part of the balance staff or the actual balance staff itself. Um, and lots of measurements can be taken. And if you uh, look, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, at the very ends, you can see uh, the, the pivots. They're a bit customized on either end. But the, uh, what I was able to uh, measure roughly was the top pivot or the bottom pivot on the right-hand side was about 0.2 millimeters. So anybody who's interested in clock repairs, when you get into uh, platform escapement and watch repairs, your dimensions go down significantly. And uh, so do the challenges of, uh, of those repairs. But there's lots of, uh, lots of measurements you can make and uh, people have actually made balance staff replacements, and I'm not one of those who could do something like that. So what did I do? I thought I was gonna plan for success. And what I would do 
is I would use a one inch finishing nail or a number of them, hack the end off, putting, putting them in my lathe. I would hack the head off and use that as uh, an example of the end of the balance staff. And I would try to start drilling into the balance staff. But of course, before you do that, you have to have uh, drills, <clears throat> excuse me, that are about 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters in, in, in size. So I did a, 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 a certain amount of internet searching and I did find that uh, carbide drills existed uh, that were in those dimensions. And so I bought uh, two sets uh, of, of those carbide drills and started uh, attempting to drill holes that would go uh, inside the nail. So you can see that in this picture here, I'm just filing off the face so it's nice and flat so that it could uh, be easy to drill into. So here we go. And uh, uh, as people in the uh, coffee clutch, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tuesday meetings that Paul uh, Sonnison has, I uh, have, no, have heard all about this uh, <laughs> project over the last month or so. And as you can see here, on the left-hand side is the nail. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go back here. On the right-hand side is uh, a uh, carbide drill. So it's a very thick end on the, on the right-hand side where it fits into the uh, chuck and then it goes right down to the uh, drill size, which is a very good design because uh, it fits into an, a, a normal truck. And so I started with a 0.1 millimeter uh, drill, snap, uh, the carbide drills, you know, very little pressure and the drills go snap and off. So I went to 0.2 millimeters, snap, 0.3 millimeters, snap, and so, I was not having a lot of luck with uh, the carbide drill. They would start drilling a little bit, but just the slightest little uh, resistance somewhere, and they, uh, they're they very brittle and they would just snap like mad. And so I started doing some more search and searches. And you can see here, uh, if you use uh, a high speed, oh. oops, she's back again. If you use high speed uh, drill, um, high-speed steel drill, you can actually... Please unmute uh, Shirley. Please mute Shirley. Yeah, just give me a second. I'm going to see if I can... Uh... Well, so he needs a cataract. He has to go to... <laughs> Shirley? London, Toronto. Oh. For his eyes. So she said... Where is she? Use the car and he can't drive it. So I'm going to see if I can. I don't think Paul is able to. I said, well, maybe I'll see it at a car show. She won't, won't be this year because you be so much preparation to get... I should be able to. I'd have to go... Said, it takes a year to plan these things. I would have to. Let's see if I can anyway. find her. Surely. So she said, would you think... Mute. <laughs> she should... She's showing muted on my screen. Yes, I just I just muted her. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oops. Beep. Going on here. Nope. Backwards. She's backwards. She's got me all. There you go. So, so I uh, discovered that. Oh, geez. I discovered that high speed uh, steel uh, might be a better alternative. And so I started working on the nail, as you can see here. Here's one of those one inch finishing nails. And the idea is on the internet, I went and I bought some uh, 0.3 millimeter wire that was going to act as the pivot for the balance staff. And so what I needed to do is I needed to drill a 0.3 millimeter hole in the uh, movement and then uh, attach the wire and then do some fine tuning so it's the right shape and right size. So I was cautiously optimistic when I got the uh, high-speed steel drill bit, because you can see in the nail, it was doing uh, a very good job. 
Um, one of the problems I had with the high speed uh, steel, however, is it's shaped like a regular drill bit, just a one, one, one size, so it's a point three millimeters all the way along the whole thing. And if you look in your end stock, the piece of the end stock of the uh, lathe, the unit that I had in there, do you see that tiny little wee hole in there? I had this thing clamped up as tight as I could have it. That's bigger than 0.3 millimeters. So if I tried to put uh, the uh, 0.3 millimeter drill bit in there, it doesn't hold because that is too big. So that <laughs> so all of a sudden you start scratching your head, what am I going to do? So luckily I was looking around in my uh, tool supplies and I found a pin vise. And a pin vise is something that you would uh, quite often see used in something like a, uh, a clock, a watch repairs. And so I, I got the pin vise and uh, found out that yes, it would actually grab the drill bit. And I ended up having to hold the pin vise, but on the, I, I put the end of the pin vise, you can see, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but I put the end of the pin vise in the tailstock where that big chuck was, it would hold that, but it still wiggled around a bit. So I had to use my hand to steady it. And this shows you kind of uh, the, the situation. I On the left hand side you can see the tailstock of the lathe uh, reaching out and holding on to one side of the balance staff while the other side of the balance staff was actually in the uh, lathe itself and that way I could find out or make sure that there was no jiggle room when I started turning the uh, turning the uh, balance staff. So now I knew it was nice, nicely in, nice and centered cautiously optimistic and so I started drilling. This is the uh, <clears throat> balance staff on the left hand side and this is the pin vise that I'm holding uh, partially supported by the tailstock on the uh, on the balance staff arbor and I, I slowly and gently start uh, working. I was really surprised uh, in that I was able to hold it and keep it uh, in, in the right position. I filed down the uh, broken arbor to a, a relatively flat uh, shape and I started drilling gently and slowly. <laughs> Guess what? Just like people were predicting, snap, 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 snap. People are saying, you're never going to be able to do it. No, it's not going to happen. And so it would have happened, or it would have worked, I think, maybe if, uh, from a conclusion perspective, and this is more of a question for everybody, the balance staff seemed to be made of hardened steel. And it, so it resisted being drilled. Now I was able to use a high speed steel drill in a nail, but it would do nothing on the balance staff. So my, uh, my uh, I guess, bottom line for all of this is that I think the, uh, the actually balance staff itself would have to be softened somehow so you could drill it. And that's, that's way too minuscule for, uh, for me. So unfortunately, I, I had to contact Serge and <laughs> well, I have good news and I have bad news. Uh, everything else has been cleaned on the movement, but uh, that uh, balance staff is uh, uh, not, not, not happy. And so that's the, uh, that's the end of my slideshow. And the, the moral of the story is working on small pieces of equipment like that is really interesting. And I actually really enjoyed it because it's uh, the dimensions so different. But now I'm going to ask Serge to, uh, uh, he's going to, it looks like he's doing it right now, uh, put his uh, uh, presentation slideshow. And then if he would tell us his perspective of what this thing is that I couldn't fix. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Very good. So uh, 
a little bit of background. Uh, I'm a weatherman. Uh, I've worked for the Weather Service for almost 35 years, so I'm due to retire this year. And uh, I started back in the 80s, uh, pre-computer age, when uh, weather was monitored by humans, and um, uh, a lot of the aspects of weather, whether it be recording, um, uh, forecasting, it was all done by humans for the most part. And when I was about ready to retire, I started thinking about my career. And I was on the environment, not the Environment Canada, but the federal government Crown Assets uh, webpage. And I found what they called a barrel graph. And I bid on it and I won. And unfortunately, the, uh, the clock wasn't working. So this presentation is about that barrel graph and other meteorological instruments that use mechanical clocks. Uh, all of which I've used in, uh, in my career, especially early on. So uh, since way back in the 1800s when we started um, uh, forecasting weather, humans had to first of all measure different elements of weather. Pressure was one of them. And it wasn't just instantaneous pressure, weight of the atmosphere, but what the forecasters wanted to know was uh, also what is it now, but how is it changing? So the rate of change, the characteristics of the pressure at a given point, comparing it to other points on a map. Temperature is also very important, but not just the actual temperature, but what was the highest temperature? What was the minimum temperature in the day? And were there any <laughs> wild fluctuations in changes? <clears throat> Humidity, same thing, um, actual, maximum, minimum. And when it came to precipitation, uh, obviously the total amount of precipitation in a specific time, rate, and incremental amounts. So. I mean, those are just a few of the elements that are monitored in weather. Uh, but back in the 1800s, that was pretty well all you could monitor. We didn't have weather balloons back then. We didn't have satellites, didn't have any of that. So it was very, very basic. So here is the barrel graph uh, that was on the Crown Assets. And I actually took a picture of my computer with the Crown Assets webpage and the barrel graph itself. They were invented in 1844 and used to record continuous atmospheric pressure. And with time added to the recording of pressure, you actually got the characteristics of the pressure. So what I mean by that is was it falling rapidly? Was it rising rapidly? Uh, did it fall then rise? Because all of those things mean certain things to uh, forecasters. In the weather service, we typically look in the previous three hours. So every three hours, we have a what we call a synoptic or a intermediate synoptic observation and the characteristic of pressure during the previous three hours is fairly important to us. The initial barrel graphs that were developed back in the 1800s employed a seven day clock. So there was seven days worth of pressure recorded on a chart. Uh, but we found, or I guess at that time, they found that the, you know, the details of the pressure changes were too small. So they employed a three-day clock uh, to replace uh, the seven-day one, which allowed meteorologist or the weather observer to actually see a little bit more of the characteristics. So here's a sample of another barrel graph, and you, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse here. Uh, the clock is encased inside of this drum, and the pen uh, goes up and down based on pressure. 
And then inside the box, you would have the charts. So typically in this box is where we would keep a month's worth of charts. These charts would then get shipped off to the head office in Canada. It was Toronto and they would, I guess, catalog them, put them in the archives, whatever. There's a close up picture of what the chart looked like. And this is a description of a barograph. So hopefully you see my pen. This is the drum where the chart would, uh, would rest on. And you would line it up for the specific time that you would replace the chart at. What you see here is the uh, aneroid cell. The aneroid cell is basically just a sealed container. And as the weight of the atmosphere lessens, then whatever pressure of air which was in the sealed container would expand. As the pressure increases, then that container would, would collapse. So that container attached to the arm would then go right up and down on the chart as the clock would rotate the chart. Here's a more close-up description of what I was talking about. This is the aneroid cell. And with as the pressure would fall, uh, this aneroid cell would expand. And by expanding, it would push up on this lever. That lever would move another one. And then eventually, it would move the arm, which is now resting on the chart. And as the chart would turn, uh, it would draw a pen trace on the chart. Here's an example of a barograph chart. And this is obviously one of the older charts uh, with multiple days on it, not just the three. But you can see how uh, the chart itself is calibrated. And uh, there's the time increments as well as the chart would rotate. And you can see the, uh, the pressure differences and how it fluctuated from one day to the next. I found this interesting. Um, uh, I found the manual for the barograph and there was a little portion and I, th I, th I thought I'd share it with you. The, the, the language that was used back in the 40s and 50s was, was very, very, um, how do I describe it? Very frank. They didn't mince words. And it talks about who should be repairing these clocks. It says local jewelry or clock repair shops are also not competent to repair these clocks as they lack the proper parts and the necessary uh, equipment. So I found that pretty interesting how the, just a the language that's used um, in these manuals from back in the 40s and, and 50s. Another instrument that's used is called the tipping bucket rain gauge recorder. So once again, it's virtually the same clock, a little bit different uh, mechanism or different gears to change it from a three day or seven day to a one day. So with a tipping bucket rain gauge chart, uh, we have the chart that rotates for 24 hours. So the drum is 24 hours and the pen trace uh, records 0.2 millimeter of rain. So outside we would have a large system called the tipping bucket rain gauge uh, drum, I guess it was called. There was a funnel uh, on top. Uh, precipitation rain uh, would fall into the funnel. It would fall in. It would hit this little bucket it, the bucket was calibrated to hold 0.2 millimeters of water. As soon as it reached 0.2 millimeters, it would tip. The tipping action would, would activate a, um, well, in this case, it shows it to be mechanical, but the ones I used were electronic. It would, act, act, it would activate a, a pulse charge where there was a coil here on the side and that pulse would increment this needle either up or down. So 
here in this case, the chart is coming down. So every time it would increment down would be 0.2 until it would reach bottom. And then it would start incrementing up in 0.2 millimeter increments. Now, all of that precipitation would often fall into another jar where you'd be able to use a calibrate and make sure that what was recorded on the chart was actually recorded uh, in the bottom of the container. Here's an actual picture of a tipping bucket uh, with an electronic activation. So it's stainless steel, of course, and this is with a funnel removed from the top of the tipping bucket mechanism. But if you can imagine a funnel being above this bucket, water would fall into this bucket 0.2 millimeters. It would tip over and then start feeling the second portion. So as soon as it tips over, the water would run out and then it would just tip back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until it stopped raining. So it had a 24 hour chart clock and the tipping buckets were actually used to record more than rain. The funnel, uh, they were able to add a heater to it so it would actually melt hail or snow. Uh, but one of the problems with the tipping buckets and as I've seen particularly in, in the prairies is that with some of the really severe storms, uh, the rain would fall at a rate much faster than what the funnel could funnel. And so the funnel would sometimes overflow. And uh, so it never really caught all of the precipitation or accurately represented the, uh, the rate in which the precipitation fell. Here is a close up example of the tipping bucket range gauge chart. So again, 24 hours. Um, and you'd start it at zero, usually at six universal time coordinated. Um, so depending on which part of the country you were in uh, would vary in time. But uh, so always calibrated to universal time coordinated or Zulu time or GMT as some people probably um, uh, knew it from. Uh, uh, th that's when we would start it. And then you can see here how, you know, there was a couple quick increments and then there was about a 10 minute lag. And then, so you could actually measure how fast the rain fell. That information is very important, not just for forecasters, but for engineers. When they're building design loads on roofs. If you've traveled across the country, you'll see how roofs of some buildings are not, like they're not all the same slope. In some parts of the country, you need to have a higher slope on the roof. Uh, the design load, so how many, um, I forget what they're called, but underneath a, uh, the roof, underneath the shingles, uh, depending on what the snow load or the, the rain load or hail, uh, you the engineers would identify and say, okay, well, you need to have uh, roof joists, I think is what they're called, uh, every 18 inches as opposed to 24. And so this information was particularly useful for engineers. We also had a thermograph. So again, thermograph measuring temperature. Same principle again, uh, a drum and a chart, but this time, uh, we, the pen trace was attached to a pressure or temperature sensitive uh, piece of metal. And again, it would record what the temperature was at different times of the day. And from this chart, we'd be able to determine, well, what was the highest temperature? What was the lowest temperature? And that was called the thermograph. We also had another instrument which employed, again, another uh, a chart called the thermo hydrograph. So on one side or on one top part of the chart was temperature and on the bottom part of the chart was humidity. And the humidity, uh, we would measure that with horsehair. 
So on one side of the chart, you'd have horse hair strung out and attached to uh, the arm. And that horse hair was calibrated to humidity. You could use human hair, uh, but my understanding from when I took my courses way back when uh, was that the horse hair was much more sensitive and easier to calibrate uh, to humidity than human hair. Uh, but that was another instrument that employed the exact same clock in a drum uh, to measure weather elements. So there's another picture of the clock that I provided to Dawn. Uh, I acquired this clock from Crown Assets. I paid, uh, I think it was $50 for it. Um, I, I had hoped to get the clock working. Unfortunately, the platform is not. But I, I reached out to another friend of mine um, who is still working for Environment Canada. He's retiring this year as well. And he has the clock uh, in storage where it's still working. So I'm hoping that the platform is identical and Dawn could probably have a little bit more work and either interchange some gears or use the platform from this other clock uh, to put on to the one that I have. So I'll let you decide, Dawn, which one is in better shape and the best way to go forward with that. It's interesting to note that there's only one weather station in Ontario that's still using a barograph chart, and that's Pickle Lake, Ontario. Uh, all other weather stations are now basically computerized. Everything's done electronically. Uh, there's no mechanical clocks in anything anywhere. And I'm not sure why Pickle Lake is still using a barograph, but um, the clock that they have in in Thunder Bay that I'm acquiring is is a 24-hour uh, clock as opposed to a, um, so it was for a tipping bucket rain gauge, um, but hopefully the platform uh, will work for, the, uh, for my purposes. For those of you who may be interested, I thought I'd add this. Uh, the places I've worked in my uh, wonderful 35-year career, uh, this is the Arctic Circle here where the yellow line is. And this is Canada's north. I started out, I worked about seven months in Hall Beach. Uh, I worked in Resolute Bay and I worked in a place called Mold Bay. And then I worked again in Resolute Bay. And then I worked down south and I worked in Norman Wells as well. Here's a uh, picture of the uh, Mold Bay weather station. So if you can imagine being up here, you're thousands of kilometers from any community. And at the weather station, there's six people. And uh, back in my time, we would have a plane come in uh, once every six weeks, uh, weather permitting, uh, with fresh produce and supplies and mail. And um, I drove this old bombardier uh, to launch weather balloons. This is where uh, we would launch our weather balloons from. Uh, it was, um, we would fill up the weather balloon inside of this garage. And then if it was very windy, we wouldn't open the door until it was time to release the balloon and the instrument. The second room here is where we generated our own hydrogen. So we used hydrogen as a lifting gas for the balloons. This is a view of the um, Mold Bay weather station from where we launched the weather balloons from. So we wanted to keep the hydrogen uh, generator and the hydrogen storage far away from where we lived <laughs> because hydrogen can be pretty dangerous, uh, especially if mixed with oxygen. And um, so this is a view of the weather station uh, and all the buildings associated from where we launched the weather balloons from. In the south, um, this is Manitoba border here. I worked in Winnipeg. Uh, the Manitoba border ends here. This is Saskatchewan. I worked in Cree Lake and in Estevan. I worked <clears throat> in Edmonton, Stony Plain, Rocky Mountain House. 
I was a weather station manager in Pincher Creek. I did all of my training at the time in the early 80s in Cornwall. I worked in London, Ontario, uh, Montreal, St. John's, Newfoundland, and I ended up here in Ottawa and uh, just loved my career. Uh, so that's it for me. I'll, I'll entertain some questions if there are any. And if not, then I thank you for your time and I hope you appreciated and um, enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much, Serge. That was fantastic. I really appreciate the fact that uh, I guess you can un unshare your uh, your screen, and uh, then I I really appreciate the diverse uh, mechanical components that you were had had to be aware of, and a bit shocked that uh, jewelers weren't able to repair the gears on <laughs> the <platform laughs> game. Um, apparently, this one wasn't. Uh, not that I'm a jeweler. But uh, yes, uh, perhaps if people have any questions, you can unmute, unmute yourself and then uh, ask your question and then mute yourself. I was just noticing that ABEC stands for All British Escapement Company. Oh. Uh, what Don did not tell you, I, I did get a hold of a company in, in England uh, that said they, were, they would repair it, um, but the cost would have been horrendous. It would have been something like uh, between three and $500 uh, because I would have had to have shipped the entire clock there. And then it would have been several hundred dollars to repair. They have a lot of spare parts and stuff. And then they would have shipped it back to me at my own cost. And although I'd love to have a working barrel graph, um, you can see it actually behind me. If you see my pen here, it's sitting on the mantle. So it's mainly more of a, of a conversation piece uh, that I wanted for my household. And um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm okay if it doesn't work anymore. I know that the pressure, the pen trace does change. So the aneroid cell is still good. Uh, it would be nice if, there were, if the clock mechanism worked so that, you know, if I really wanted to monitor the pressure, I could. Uh, but I had purchased it mainly as a conversation piece and as a bit of a keepsake for um, you know, the early times when I worked in the weather service and, and um, sort of as a reminder of how things were done back then. I mean, you know, back in the 80s, having this type of a meeting online would have been, you know, Star Trek type stuff. And here we are, you know, 30 years later, and we're able to do these, uh, these presentations and share this information online. I've been a teacher for the last four years, and um, with this pandemic, I was supposed to teach uh, 20 people uh, to go work on Coast Guard ships. And I told my bosses, it's impossible. I, you can't teach the people, you know, the information I need to do. I need to teach them online. I thought there's, there's no way, uh, but I was forced to do it and I'm amazed at the outcome. Uh, so I graduated uh, 18 out of the 20 uh, last December, and um, most of which are heading up to the Arctic here on Canada Coast Guard ships in the next, um, well, they'll be leaving around June 15th. That's when the first ships start heading north. Thank you for your presentation. If they have the parts in England, are they willing to just sell you the parts that you need? That no, Don they're not. Use? No, they won't do that. I, no, I asked them. I asked them even just to sell me an escapement. And they said, nope. They said, you have to send us the entire clock. We will install the escapement and get it working for you, clean it, all that stuff, and, and then send it back to you. It's similar to... And I know I'm talking a lot here and I'm hoping I'm, I'm not taking too much of your time, but 
I, I inherited a watch uh, from my father. Uh, again, a watch that he purchased in the 1940s. And he paid close to $300 for it in the 1940s. And it worked up until about 10 years ago. But the watch itself, I guess the crystal had cracked a little bit. And I brought it to a jeweler. And the only way he would repair it is if he completely rebuilt the entire watch and put on new gold on the face and made it look brand new. Well, I didn't want it brand new. I just wanted it working again. You know, I wanted to keep it the way it was uh, when my father passed, but um, he refused. He says, nope, it has to be completely redone. Otherwise, won't touch it. So I, I get the impression that that happens a lot in the industry, but I could be wrong. Um, I, I just wanted to add, that's Tom Deavy, uh, that, um, let me see, yeah, the, where I got the All British Escapement Company was from the BritishMuseum.org. They also state in the biography, which I think I believe Don had mentioned, the company is, was founded by Alan Gordon Smith of Smith's in 1928 to supply escapements to be fitted with Smith's and Jagger clocks particularly those used for, made for automobiles. So just looking on eBay, and there is uh, you know, a Smith's clock platform for car clock. You might find, if you look there, you might find uh, you know, a similar part. You know? Yeah, I, I did look on uh, eBay before I spoke to Don. There wasn't anything at that time. Uh, but I guess you're right. It's worth uh, looking occasionally, and you never know what comes up at the last minute. So uh, that's a good idea. I'll probably continue to keep looking on eBay, and hopefully at some point uh, a proper statement comes up. And you might try the uh, UK eBay. Yes, right. Uh, are you a bit confused here? It's JD here. Are you looking for the for a full escapement? Are you looking for a, a balance stuff to have the balance put back on, or which part are you looking for? Oh, you tell me. I don't know. I just I just want it working. Balance. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what uh, what it is is would uh, balance staff and spring. Well, spring. Yeah. No, no, but. I mean, no, no one is raises their he's raising their hands. I have been been wanting to intervene here because I think that in Ottawa there's there's ample uh, people, many people with good knowledge to work on your clock, even though the company claims that they're the only ones that can repair it. And I mean, that's that's what the Swiss industry right now says about their own watches that that you can't send it to anyone else and they won't sell parts. But it's it it you know like the instructions that you read to us from the, from the what what was very blunt and everything we talked about jewelers not able not able to repair the clock but they said nothing about a trained watchmaker because there are trained watchmakers in Ottawa right here um, there are some in Montreal there are some in Toronto that that could very well take on that task with uh, less cost of shipping for sure. Um, and and able to to manufacture the parts that are missing, uh, such as like a staff. And JD is just just you know is is making uh, staffs one after the other um, in, in his shop. And and it's 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 not impossible. This is this is these are techniques that can be taught, that can be learned, and with skills that can be perfected with time. Um, but there's a lot of people uh, that could repair that that clock, but they need to look at it. Yeah. And just for a reality check, I don't know, I don't know how much you made per day as a as a weatherman, but a, a watchmaker should be able to earn four hundred dollars a day for for his work. And mm -hmm. so if if they spend a day uh, repairing your clock, that that's worth four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's time. It's not the parts really, or the material, I should say, but it's the time. And if, if the watchmaker has to make a part, mm -hmm. like a machinist has to make a part and, and, cut, a, and cut teeth um, on, on a wheel, 
it takes time, but um, at the end, you'll have a, a clock that will work. And uh, uh, long after you've uh, paid the bill, you'll be very happy that when, uh, every time that it works. Thank you very much, Serge. I really liked the presentation, by oh, the way. Thank you. Um, um, uh, you know, I am from a farming community and weather was always, always important for us um, uh, to, to know the, the forecast. And, yeah. and we were the first, my father was the first in our little village to acquire our weather state, a radio, radio weather, no, weather radio uh, with uh, the specialized uh, stations that broadcasted yeah. all the time. And the neighbors used to stop by our house and, and we would turn on the radio for them to listen to the forecast. Yeah. That's, that's how it was. I, uh, I, I got to share a story with you. Early in my career, about four or five years in, I met my current wife. She grew up on a farm in southern Saskatchewan. Her father lived there his entire life and died there, as a matter of fact. And I was a young and cocky weatherman. I showed up at the farm one day in the middle of summer and I said, yeah, this is, uh, looks like we're going to get about an inch, inch and a half of rain. And Zena's father looked at me and he smiled. He looked outside at the sky, he says, looked at the wind, how the flag was blowing. He says, no, nah, no, nah, we're not going to get anything. And here I was, a cocky young man as well. Yes, absolutely. You know, almost pounding my fist. We're going to get some rain. Well, you can imagine who was right and who was wrong. Uh, farmers, especially ones that have uh, lived and worked the same area most of their lives, uh, it, it's their livelihood. They know the weather because they pay attention to it. And it's just amazing how much you can learn about weather if that's all you do, if it's if, if you're dependent on weather, you will learn weather. And whether you learn it through the books or just through observation, uh, you can get pretty proficient at it. So, yeah, thank you. That's why they still sell the Farmer's Almanac. <laughs> <laughs> the Farmer's Almanac, yeah. Don't get me started on that one. <laughs> And now it's time for show and tell. Do it. Does anybody have any uh, things for the show and tell today? Yes, with apologies for those who don't like Snyder clocks. The late 1950s, it's electric, pink dome in the middle. It's metal, metal pieces that have been painted. And I found this one on Marketplace, uh, on Facebook Marketplace several months ago and the fellow wanted too much money for it. But uh, I get back to him again uh, two weeks ago because uh, there was a generous donation to the museum that helped pay for most of it. Prices for this sort of thing, as you probably know, have gone up by a factor of four and five. I would have got this for 50 bucks 10 years ago, a lot more this time. And the most interesting thing is the payment was made to Hotel Nomad in Quebec City. And the gentleman that was selling it runs the hotel, I believe. And this was in their 1950s room, driving visitors crazy who were staying in that room. I guess he must have been running electric and it may have been a bit noisy. So he decided to pull it out and sell it. And when I offered him a better price from my point of view, originally, he said he couldn't do it because he paid too much for it. So there's the problem with pricing. People pay too much. And then there's the script name Snidey across the top. People pay too much for it. And this is, we know this is late 50s because on the back it says Snyder Clock Manufacturing Company, Toronto, one of Harry Snyder's designs. And that's after 1957 late 50s. So love it or hate it, there you are. Anybody else have anything for show and tell? I have something here just out of interest if somebody's interested in that kind of stuff. Let me see if I can. Uh... So this is a, um... can you see that? 
This is a gilded bronze piece from a clock that I'm restoring right now that I acquired from France. It's from 1730 by Julien Leroy, and it's a cartel, cartel d'applique. So um, I can't show you the whole clock because it's all apart, but I've been staring at this thing. This is a, a bronze, uh, because the furniture that was made in the uh, era of Louis XIV, Louis XV, this is actually from the Regency period between those two kings. And uh, the furniture, uh, whether it was dressers or uh, desks and whatnot, were uh, decorated with these gilded bronze pieces hmm. that were um, cast, carved, um, chased. I mean, they're works of art. So I really like this figurine, female figurine, which is basically on the front of the clock. Uh, it's on the, uh, just below the dial. So there's basically a glass door covering the dial and on the bottom part of it is this figurine. And I was trying to figure out, well, what, what does this represent? Because obviously there's all kinds of uh, uh, allegorical representations to uh, mythology and so on and so forth. And from what I've been able to determine I have not seen this particular uh, type of bronze on other clocks from that era that I've been able to look at on in museum sites on the internet. But it represents a goddess called Keto, C-E-T-O or K-E-T-O. Okay. Uh, Ketos in Greek means sea monster. And it's in the Greek mythology, Keto, uh, this, fig, this female figure, is the goddess of the dangers of the sea and of sea monsters. So you can probably see that she's sitting on some kind of a sea monster. It's got a bit of a head to one side and a bit of a tail, almost like a snake on the other side. And she seems to have a trident in, in one of her... Uh, hands, probably to tame the monster. In uh, Greek mythology, you've heard of the goddess Gaia, which often used to represent the earth. Gaia, uh, Keto was a daughter of Gaia, and her brother was called, I can't even make up my, my handwriting here, but basically Keto had a daughter, a, a, a brother, and together I guess they were kind of naughty brother and sister. They begat sea monsters. So I find that fascinating, don't you? So somebody had the idea of, to carve that and to put that on front of a clock. My thinking is that there was talking about the Deva Sovel's book earlier about finding longitude. Longitude was a, a problem that uh, you know, concerned many people, especially the uh, maritime nations like England, France, Holland, Spain. And for, for many, many years, they had been trying to find a solution. And in 1730, when this clock was made, it was still a solution looking for, so, uh, a problem looking for a solution. So I think the reference to the goddess of sea monsters, which people felt were responsible for sinking a lot of ships. Well, it, was, it wasn't that, it was the ships would basically run aground on rocks or uh, sand uh, uh, or reefs because they couldn't figure out where they were on a longitude perspective. And many, many, many ships, many, many lives were lost by the seafaring nations until finally in the, uh, later in the 18th century, people like um, Harrison in England, Pierre Leroy and Berthoud in France basically figured out a way to measure longitude using a clock. So I think that's the reference to, uh, to that kind of uh, problem that uh, people were having and clockmakers were very much engaged in trying to find a solution to the problem of longitude. And that's my best guess. I mean, someone could... Uh, <laughs> argue with me 
if I was speaking to museum conservators, but that's my thinking as to why they put that goddess on the clock that I own. There you go. My little show and tell for today. Thank you.